Writing Class Radio. I'm Andrea Askowitz, your host and your teacher. Writing Class Radio is a podcast of a writing class and more. If you're just tuning in now for the first time, this is episode six. You may want to go back to episode one, but we know how that goes. So if you'd rather start here, bienvenidos. That's welcome in Miami. The purpose of Writing Class Radio is to connect with people who love stories and who get inspired by hearing other people tell their stories and who want to learn a little bit about how to write their own stories. In each class, I give two writing prompts. I'll say something like, a time you made a choice. Then I'll say go, and I'll give six, eight, maybe 12 minutes to write. Then we read our work and discuss what worked and what we want to know more about. Each day in class, two students also get a chance to bring in a longer story they've been working on at home. Our job as classmates is to act as an editorial board. A big part of a writer's job is to make decisions alone. But to help with those lonely decisions, we have our writing class. My approach to writing and teaching is to make writing more a team sport. Here's how this podcast works. We broadcast stories that were written and read in class. Some are raw bursts inspired by in-class prompts. Other stories may have started from a prompt and are then reworked at home. And sometimes we'll leave class and take you on a field trip into one of our classmates' lives. Allison plays a dual role, and so do I. I'm both the teacher and the producer of this podcast. Allison is both a student in the class and the producer of this podcast. Sometimes we record in class, and sometimes the two of us record in the studio, her kitchen or mine. Together, we're figuring this out as we go. I've heard many authors say, each story wants to come out in its own way. I've always cringed at that idea. The cringe part for me is the personification of a story, like it's a living thing separate from the writer even before it's created. That just sounds goofy. I mean, come on. You decide how you want to write your story. But I'm starting to understand that notion in a big way because each episode of this podcast is like a new live thing. And each one seems to be coming out the way it wants to come out. Sorry, I see that I just said that cringy thing. But here's what happens. Each episode starts with an idea and a blank page on Google Docs where I write the script. And then it takes on some form. And then Allison says, No, 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 no. No, that makes no sense. Or, Yes, that's perfect. Writing a podcast, writing anything, is an exercise in starting over every single time. Writing is facing a blank sheet or a blank screen. And writing is trusting the story will come out the way it wants to. Today on our show, we're going to give you Wendy, the way she revealed herself in the first semester. In our first class, I gave the prompt, how are you really? Wendy wrote about her ex-husband's murder. Um, on July 18th, 2014, someone shot my ex-husband in the head while he was pulling into our garage after he dropped our then three and four-year-old sons off at school. I only found out this information when the police picked me up from a lunch date I was having with two girlfriends and insisted that I come with them back to the station and then interrogated me for eight straight hours, because it's usually the ex-wife. I'm not really okay. I list the things that are going well when people ask this question. My children are thriving and happy. We live with my parents who are incredibly devoted to our well-being. I started my own immigration practice and I just signed up to do a one-year clerkship with the Federal 11th Circuit in September, which means I can get off Obamacare and have one year guaranteed of a steady income. But the truth is that I miss my life. I was a professor at Florida State University College of Law. I was so proud to be a public interest attorney and a mentor to my students. The novel I wrote about my client's stories had just been chosen as the common read for all first-year students at FSU. In August, I was supposed to be the commencement speaker, 
and then I was supposed to take my brain cancer surviving just turned 70 father on a trip to Machu Picchu. And I don't get to complain that I didn't do any of those things because I am alive. Thank you. Thank you for reading and telling us that and writing that. Okay, what do you guys think? What do you want to know more about? We learn a lot about the narrator. We learn how smart she is. We learn how much she's done in this time, you know, where most people would be probably in bed, crying and on drugs and medication. <clears throat> something that I was curious about, if there's something in there that um, is causing her not to be able to really get any sympathy or if she feels like she's not getting sympathy because it was an ex or she's not allowed to grieve him. I'm like, I'm so curious to see how the grieving process went. What do you call it? The When they just say the story and they don't... Hot topic, yeah. cold pros. It's just said and you're, you're like, wow, that sucks. And what she's talking about, about hot topics, cold pros, is that it's not sentimental. It's just reported. The tone is perfect. What else? As horrible as the experience was, I mean, it was sort of, I, I was happy at the end when she said that and she talked about them living with her family and their family. I mean, it made me um, on some level feel, I mean, I don't know, at least happy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it wasn't easy. I think it's okay for us to feel uneasy for a long time in um, as, as readers or as listeners to this story. So I wouldn't want the narrator to worry about us. Um, the thing that I think this story is really about, and it might change, but I think it's about the line that really struck me is I don't get to complain because I'm alive. It was hard not to get up to hug Wendy. It was hard to not ask personal questions. And it was hard to not ask detailed questions about the crime, like who murdered her ex-husband and why. But we're not the podcast serial. Our job as editors is to give feedback on the writing, to tell her what hit us and what we want to know more about. After taking in all the comments, Wendy worked on her story at home. Two weeks later, she came back with some of the answers to our questions. In her first story, she hinted at not feeling like she can publicly express how she really feels, a theme she repeated in this next story. In her writing, though, she seems to express how she really feels. Ten months ago, someone killed the father of my children. First we got divorced, and then he got murdered. In casual conversations, I don't know whether to call him my ex-late spouse or my late ex-spouse, except that late ex-spouse sounds like late ex-spouse. Last July, someone, and we still don't know who, shot my ex-husband point blank in the back of the head as he pulled into our garage after driving our then three and four-year-old sons to preschool. We married when I was in my mid-twenties, when I thought I could cheat the system and marry a man I lacked passionate love for because, hey, didn't that die anyway during marriage? I saw his intellect and big heart and thought he would make a wonderful father for my children. Our marriage dissolved after the children arrived, as the loneliness of being married to someone that didn't view me as an equal crept in. I do believe he loved me the best way he knew how. I mean, he didn't like fiction, so... Why read my novel? It was logic, not a lack of love. It feels sacrilegious these days, even to suggest something less than heroic about my latex husband, because he was murdered. He died violently and young, and likely at the hands of a professional killer. And the media had a field day in response. I turned on the news to find photos of my children with Nancy Grace. George Stephanopoulos saying my name in reference to our acrimonious divorce, and a picture my friend took when I was her maid of honor showed as evidence why I should be treated like a murder suspect and not the mother of two fatherless boys. 
I sat on a bench last week and watched the boys play. An older woman sitting next to me commented on how adorable my boys are and asked, what does your husband do? I hate this question. I haven't yet said he doesn't do much because he's dead, but I think it sometimes. I find when I tell my, when I tell people that my children's father died, they feel sad. But when they ask the follow-up questions and find out we weren't married, they seem to feel better. I don't. Here's Wendy in response to the prompt. What is the story you tell about your relationship with your mom? My mom and I have lived together for almost a year. She is selfless, generous, loving, and beautiful. She thinks she is fat. She once got turned down for Weight Watchers because she didn't have enough excess weight to be admitted to the program. She thinks she is stupid. My mom, who won the New York Spelling Bee for middle schoolers when she was only in the sixth grade, I'm so many of the things I am because of who my mom is and who she wants me to be. I was valedictorian of my high school. She seemed proudest that I graduated high school still a virgin. I try to draw boundaries with my mom because lately there aren't any. She is caring for my children right now so that I can be here in class, more like a co-parent than a grandmother. But I accept it because as a former kindergarten teacher, she is so adept in that role. She taught my boys how to recite the 44 presidents, just like she taught me when I was four. I see myself in them, reciting, receiving praise. She has completely changed her life because mine fell apart. I write letters to her in my head every day, ones of immense gratitude for facilitating my return from the bottom. But when we speak, in the few fleeting moments when the kids or my dad don't need something, it comes out like, Is the dishwasher clean? And if not, should I run it? Or something else inconsequential about laundry or groceries or aspects of daily life. There's more of Wendy's story coming up after we talk about our awesome sponsors. I don't know what to say. What's interesting about the prompts is that sometimes they bring up memories we don't consciously realize are still affecting us. At the end of today's show, I'm going to give you a prompt. Your assignment is to see what comes up, to trust that the story will come out the way it wants to. Right now, edit later. And then record your story on the voice memo of your phone and email it to us. Your story might end up on our podcast. Stay tuned to the end of the show to hear the prompt. In response to the prompt, lies. Wendy remembers the death of her friend's father. And again, she discovers that sometimes her outward reactions don't match her inner emotions. My childhood friend Lisa told me this weekend that she never even knew I was unhappy in my marriage. I had no idea I hid it so well. I always thought that I had an expressive face, the kind that easily registered happiness and disappointments. But the more I think about it, the more I realize that most people think I am very happy all of the time because I smile constantly to try to engage with people, make them smile too. I think this face is a kind of mask that I wear out of a life of endless practice, like a kind of muscle memory for the face. Mm. I can even remember one time learning that a friend's father had died, and upon hearing the news, I smiled. It was a bizarre reaction, since I loved my friend and her dad very much. We were 13, and I remember him making pancakes for us many a Sunday morning after a few of us slept over. More than 20 years later, I still feel like a freak show thinking back on that moment. If I'm a person that likes to be funny and to use humor and levity to engage with people, then is it an authentic or inauthentic response to smile at the news of something tragic? Am I deluding others or myself when I smile or laugh through the pain of a terrible time? Am I avoiding actually bathing in the grief I I need to feel so that when time passes, I will have missed my chance to mourn? 
Danny used to tell me that everyone thought I was such a nice person and such a good person, but he was the only one that knew the truth about what a bad person I was. He was convinced I had deluded everyone but him. And later in the same class, I gave the prompt, your last intimate moment. It should be intimate when a man cries in front of you while you hold each other. And it was, but I wasn't crying. Sometimes I feel like I'm all cried out. This year, I told my small children that their father was dead and wasn't ever coming back. And a few nights ago, when a beautiful man teared up in my arms, I wondered if I could ever cry at something beautiful again. I shared a piece of writing with him I was trying out for class. It describes a scene where I'm immensely sad. He tells me he was initially impressed with all that I have accomplished, but now he's more taken with what I have endured. I appreciate his words and wonder, why can't I be that woman on the spot? Why do I reserve the written word for a place where I can accurately and painfully express myself and the in-person, real-life version for the Wendy show, jazz hands and all? I wish I could merge us so we could be less of a weirdo. I think Wendy's working on a bigger story, more than just what happened, which was that her ex-husband was murdered. Her bigger story is about what it means for her to be authentic. Why does she laugh in the face of trauma? Does everyone? Or is Wendy wearing a mask she wants to take off? She writes a lot about how people react when they hear her story. She also writes about her own reactions, how she wishes she could be as true in person as she is in her writing. So I spoke to Wendy about her experience in our class. How did she feel telling her story? And how did it feel to get our class's reaction? You asked, how, how are we doing really? And I just, I was shaking from head to toe. And I thought, okay, let's just do this. <laughs> let's just dive in. I didn't have a plan to do it, but it just felt unavoidable. The words kind of just flew out of me. But then when I was done, I sat there and I couldn't look anyone in the eye and I was sweaty and I just thought, okay, (laughs) now I've done it. Now it's out there. Now what? And so then how did you feel about the class's reaction? I felt good. Um, I felt good about the class's reaction. I, I realized that people had questions and so some of them were about the writing and how, you know, what might be different ways to tell the same story. And, and other questions were a bit more like, well, you know, what happened here and what was going on there? And I thought, oh, I don't know if you remember this. I didn't know we were all going to read what we wrote in class. I thought maybe some of us would read if we felt like it. And I, I didn't think that would be me. (laughs) So I asked her what motivated her in that moment to read her story, even when she wasn't expecting to. I think for me, a lot of the additional pain I felt, you know, on top of, of the murder and everything associated with was it felt unfair that I couldn't at least tell my own story, that the story got told for me. So I think there was an aspect of empowerment, of being able to say, no, this is my side of the story. This is what things looked like from my perspective. Flying fortress of plastic dreams Writing Class Radio is produced by Diego Saldana Rojas, Alison Langer, and me, Andrea Askowitz, with the help of Alejandro Santiago and Toby Ash. Theme music by the local Miami band Astro Maps. Writing Class Radio was recorded at the University of Miami School of Communication. Hey, if you like Writing Class Radio, Please tell all your friends and rate us on iTunes.